We've got a slightly different format to, uh, for today's Digi Shift. You have me as the as the lead controller. Exciting. Ross is the co-controller. More exciting. Um, and we've got a different format in that we have three guest speakers who are each going to. I was going to say present, but that's not quite right. They've each got a question they're going to attempt to answer around the area of managing risk and the impact of misinformation. So we have uh, Jess McBeath, we've got Irene McIntosh, and we've got Alison Stone, who are going to kind of talk. They've got 10 minutes each, 10 minutes, 10 minutes each, to kind of just look at, attempt to answer their questions and to kind of have a talk around the particular topic. And then we should have around about 20 minutes at the end left for questions from yourself. As always, we've got Jen and we've got Siobhan here as well, who will be updating our Google Doc. So at any point, if you've got questions, put them in the chat, um, raise your hand as well. So we'll get them to present and then we'll take questions at the end. So please do interact, use the chat box and we'll work it from there. As I said, it's going to be quite informal today. This is a test, there's a different format than we've done. It's not, a t if any of you were on our DigiShift last week where we tested a new Zoom function, it didn't work particularly well for folk who are joining it. So we're just trying a different way this time as well. So we're just going to have a, a different way of format. This is part of our work that we're doing with Catalyst, um, with Third Sector Lab as well, and SCVO. So it's a, a major joint effort and that allows us to reach more people, but also to have much, by, uh, much more varied and wider topics too. We've also got Bex and Paul who are on the call who are going to be um, turning this into a podcast, which they do at the end of all the calls as well, which is great. So thank you very much to them for joining us. Um, I think what we'll do before we start is I've got a little, a very small GIF I'm going to share with you, if I can find it. It's a thing where we share screen and then of course I can't find anything, the way it always works. My wonderful Zoom skills. Here we go. So as a kind of a, a starter for 10, this was certainly how I'm feeling today. So I don't know how everybody else is feeling, but I am, I was saying earlier, I have lost the plot a little bit today um, and I am struggling with, I don't even know which week we are, week eight, week nine, we were saying what week this is of lockdown. So taking a kind of a tip from Beth Cantor, what I thought we would do is to take the first minute and to grab a pen a piece of paper, a post-it note, a phone, something that you can write notes onto. And we're just going to take this first minute to write down as much as we can. So all the stuff that's in our head, we might have kids in the background. I know Jen said she's got the dog at her feet. We've got all kinds of things happening to us right now. So all the things that are in our heads right now is to actually think about what have we got going on? What's going on in our heads? and to write it down onto a piece of paper or in our phones or into a note format. You're not going to be sharing this, so don't worry. You don't have to share this with anybody. It's just simply an activity to help us become present and in the room. So I'm going to find my timer. And when you're ready, take that minute and start writing everything down. So all the stuff that's in your head, get it down onto a piece of paper or into a phone or into somewhere. Okay, that's your minute. So what I'd like you to do now is to take that, I've got a piece of paper, I'm gonna take my piece of paper, scrunch it up, and I'm gonna throw mine across the room, preferably not hitting a child, a pet, an animal, something. 
So the idea is that we've got it, we've scrunched it up, and we're just going to get rid of it for the next hour so that we can just breathe, take this time to breathe, hear from our three speakers, let their wisdom and advice flow over us so we can then go off into the world <laughs> more knowledgeable, more understanding, with more ways of working. That's the idea. Okay, are we all all right? Everybody fine? Doing all right? Super. So first off, we have got Jess. Um, hang on. Hello, hello. Hello. Oh. And the question that Jess will be answering, let me just give you a quick share so you can see it. That's not me. That's not well. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is Jess's question. So why is misinformation such a big problem? And what can we do about it? So this is for Jess, who's got 10 minutes to kind of talk around and answer this question. Do you want me to keep the question up, Jess? Or are you happy for me? No, to I've got I've got a little presentation. So I'm gonna see if I can share a screen. Super. If that'll work. Let's mm -hmm. see. Let's see. Right. Do you see me? Do you see my question on screen? Yes? yes. Okay, 10 minutes. We'll see how I get on. Uh, and obviously we've got the chat. And I'm assuming, can people unmute themselves if they want to, if they want to just interrupt and ask a question? Can people do that? Yes? No? Yes? I'm assuming yes. Right, okay, fine. So, uh, 10 minutes. Uh, what, why is misinformation such a big problem and what can we do about it? So, um, so about me, I'm an online safety consultant. So, um, and misinformation is one of the kind of topics that I kind of work on, develop educational materials on, um, think about, whatever. Huge issue. And at the moment, of course, we're seeing a lot of problems uh, with misinformation to do with lockdown and coronavirus. And I know that Irene and Alison are going to get into a bit more detail about some of that specifically. So I'm going to talk more about kind of misinformation in the round, why we have it, why it's an issue, what technology has got to do with it what tech's doing about it and some stuff that we can do about it as well. So just to start off with what we mean by misinformation, because you go back a few years and the term was fake news, which we tend to do this with these days. Um, and that's a, that was a binary way of looking at information. Yeah. So it was, that has this sort of assumption that things are either true or false and misinformation doesn't work like that, right? So what we see in terms of um, what you might term misinformation could be all kinds of content. Yes, it could be fabricated, you know, completely made up stuff. It could be manipulated content. So there's some validity to it, but it's changed. Um, we see a lot of issues with information that's taken out of context. Yeah, so for example, a photograph that's reused and shared as if it's in a different part of a different event that's happened. Um, all kinds of impersonation taking place online. We also would include within that kind of broad bag um, uh, content such as satire, right? So content that's, that's meant to be funny, <laughs> but it's misunderstood. Um, I would also include any kind of clickbait. And by that, I mean, you know, the headline says one thing, but the content is something else. Um, propaganda is, you know, a very traditional approach to... Um, something that's not false, but might be presented in a certain way for a certain angle and mistakes that are made online. And there'll be loads more, right? So it's really actually quite complex. And that's why it's a problem for us is because, um, because there's so much there. Um, the main thing I suppose is this, you know, this stuff isn't new. So this is the um, spaghetti harvest of, um, what was it, 1957, something like that. So it's a panorama video made and shared on April Fool's about a problem with the spaghetti harvest. So uh, people thought there really was a problem with um, the spaghetti harvest that year. So uh, not new, but we are, of course, seeing lots of examples of uh, misinformation. Uh, this one reared its head the other day. Um, so th this was the, the idea that when we went into lockdown uh, and the kind of environmental improvements that we saw included dolphins swimming in the canals of Venice, um, which, was, <laughs> which wasn't true. Uh, but I saw it again the other day, somebody else talking online about uh, the benefits we've had from the environment, including, you know, the dolphins in Venice. And there's something there about uh, not being able to unsee or unhear something. 
uh, we have a tendency to believe something the first time we see it um, and, and, and to be less, you know, it takes more persuasion away from that. So the first time we come across a concept, we're more likely to believe it. And also repeated, if we, if we hear something repeatedly, again, uh, we're more likely to, um, to believe it. So what's all of this got to do with technology, I suppose? What I'm not going to get into today is why people are producing um, content. Again, you know, Alison will cover some of that, for example. Uh, but what's what's te what's technology's role? And there's a number of different ways that technology has uh, shaped our engagement with information. Um, and I've, so I've got them listed there. So, I mean, in no particular order. So normalizing, what I mean by that is that we find ourselves online in spaces where people are talking about stuff. Um, you get, you can kind of get like a group think idea and you can also be groomed into certain ways of thinking. So if we think about extreme content online, which can be anything, right? So it, it could be, um, it could be uh, conspiracy theories. It could be, you know, terrorist type content. It could be uh, pro anorexia content. You can find yourself in a situation where, uh, in the place that you are, are online, everybody around you is talking about that as if it's normal. And part of that is this idea that we've we've ended up in a situation. Um, where information has been fed to us to take us down a certain route. Um, there's a very tribal aspect to being online, right? So it is, it, I, I think there's a polarizing aspect to it. What we find is that the people that are vocal online tend to be at one end of a spectrum or another. You don't hear an awful lot from uh, the kind of the middle ground, right? So it can be kind of um, polarizing, but also it can... Um, it can be it can give you a distorted view of re reality because the people that are most vocal online and the the um the voices that are most shared online aren't necessarily those that aren't necessarily the same as kind of in the physical world uh, but the two bits i really want to focus on was this idea of amplifying an algorithm so um so yeah where did i start with this really main thing i suppose is when i when i said about you know um t technology doesn't create the content right we create content yeah, so, so we create all the good stuff and the bad stuff. But what technology does is it amplifies it. So we know that already in terms of the idea of clickbait, for example, that content that is more shocking or more emotionally charged uh, is more likely for people to watch and share and like and distribute and therefore it gets amplified more people are likely to see it so there's no doubt that there's, there's a there's an effect there uh, in terms of misinformation because it is more likely to be have those elements about it uh, but the other um, aspects that we've come to understand over the last couple of years is the role of algorithmically generated um, content and suggestions so the classic example would be on YouTube, where you search for something on YouTube and then you get recommended videos on the right hand side. Um, and what we've come to realize is that uh, the recommendations are quite likely to take you down a rabbit hole of uh, a certain approach. So the example was it was a journalist a couple of years ago who, who um, she, she uh, searched for a video of Donald Trump's inauguration speech online and she watched the speech, uh, but then she let the recommendation algorithm run. She had autoplay running. She didn't do anything. And after about five videos, she found herself watching a far right uh, conspiracy theory video. Uh, and what she discovered was that um, YouTube's trying to feed you the most interesting and relevant, but also the most clickbaity type content to keep you on the platform. And it tends to take us down more extreme um, perspectives. So there are some big criticisms there in terms of technology and how it's designed. The tech companies have been doing quite a bit to try and address this. There has been some talk about changing the algorithm. There's been lots of very specific things that have been done. So like WhatsApp, for example, prevented auto forwarding you couldn't you couldn't forward a message beyond a certain number of people because they were trying to stop and um, this idea of kind of viral content going going too far um, there was lots of um lots of the organizations stopped hosting certain content so um instagram blocked kind of vaccine hoax hashtags uh youtube stopped red recommending flat earther videos uh, amazon removed anti-vax documentaries from from amazon prime um but the underlying way that the technology is designed is still essentially there which is about keeping us on screen yeah and the problem with that is that it's more of that clickbaity type um content uh, so just in terms of that kind of um, perspective when we're working with people and i, I have talked to professionals i not directly but i have talked to professionals who are working with people that have got themselves into extreme perspectives um and i think it's worth being mindful of what how people can get like that so this is just an example on screen a screen of an anti-vaxxer 
and you'll see that having been um, that the, the anti-vax person says oh there's multiple scientific studies on the dangers of vaccinations uh, the other person says well show me one of these and the anti-vaxxer says ah the government controls the internet just now and that's a classic uh, kind of conspiracy theorist type response to an issue in that when challenged facts don't really work because we've got ourselves in a headspace that's actually about um, identifying with a with a movement and a cause uh, this is just a very quick example of the kind of things that you can see so facebook for example this is a this is a, a kind of um a, an incorrect um thing on facebook and again if you look at it if you actually went to look at that you would see this on top of it because facebook's working with full factors fact checkers um and the other aspect of all of this is the idea that um and i'm running over time but the idea that um there are certain movements which are very good at, um, at PR and they're very good at social media and marketing. And uh, the norm, if you like, hasn't been very good at that. So the whole vaccination um, program is, is, is an aspect of that. Uh, we haven't seen an awful lot in terms of um, strong PR machines to just explain uh, that va vaccines are the way to go. So I know there's loads there to think about, uh, but I just finally to kind of wrap up, I suppose, I wanted to look at what can we do about it. And I think there's two aspects to this. So the top bit there, I've got the news thing. It's just this idea of the basic media literacy skills. And you probably know most of these now, right? It's stuff like who created this information? You know, where did it come from? And why might they have done that? Um, perhaps I could do a Google check or, you know, whatever search engine I use and see if I can find this content elsewhere and see if other people are agreeing with it or disagreeing with it. Um, if something's too good to be true, maybe it is, you know, pause before sharing, have a think. I've, I've heard of the idea of, of taking 30 seconds, you know, like 30 seconds to wash your hands, take 30 seconds to have a think about whether this is actually right or not. Um, so there's lots of stuff there about the kind of practical steps, but I think that's only one element. Uh, and I would very much recommend Full Fact as a website to go to its UK's fact checking agency. So if you do come across information online and you think, well, I'm not sure about that, have a look at Full Fact. But the other element is at the bottom, there's this emotional, literacy if you like so recognizing that we have biases that um that this stuff can feed into um so things like conspiracy theories are, are quite easy to create that they'll, they'll be quite difficult to disprove right because when you try and disprove them you're you're, you're the suggestion is it's just a cover-up um so and there's people feeling vulnerable right now so perhaps more likely to be going down certain routes and we might have seen that for example where we've been sharing misinformation that's about health cures um for covid and it's because people are actually genuinely trying to help others as well so so that that's kind of my very quick thing and i suppose if you are working with somebody who is making some suggestions about content that you are questioning and you're not sure about one you know one of the tips is to be empathetic with it right it's not to look down on people and think that they're really stupid because they're not actually we're all going to be sharing some form of misinformation at some point or another thinking about whether they're what's their frame of mind are they in an open frame of mind where they can have a conversation about kind of facts and questions and you come at it openly as well or are they already at the point where they're kind of closed their mind and they already believe a certain perspective because that's quite a difficult one to to challenge just questioning them what the source of information is if they can actually explain to you why this particular facebook group has got more relevance than you know a government for example um might get them to think um and so it's re and also the other thing I would say, I think personally, it's really important to look at everything we see online with a critical eye, but not so critical that we go down the conspiracy theory route, right? Ult ultimate critic, ultimate cynic, I think, as a conspiracy theorist. So that's my, I've probably gone over my 10 minutes um, really quick. Hopefully that was of interest. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't been looking at the chat, so um, I'll, I'll unshare and then obviously we can see we've got our other speakers as well. So thank you very much. Try and unshare the thing just now. Ah. Thanks, Jess. I think that uh, it's a really big question to give you 10 minutes <laughs> yeah, to answer no. it. <laughs> I can't find my unsharing thing. Hold on, I'm listening. There we go. Uh, am I still sharing to you? Yeah. Uh, there we go. Yes, Stop so that's sharing. Fine. That's fine. I know that was huge. Probably too big. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> but, no, not at all. I think that's the thing around it. It's having some just some basic underlying key points of of where to go of what to think about of just um as you said using that empathy and that are they open versus the closed where they at really helps just as a starting point to think about putting things in context certainly from that point of view um, i'm going to move on to irene just for time just you were only over by about a minute so you weren't over at all so well done <laughs> i'm going to shift us along to irene as our next one um 
Irene, do you want your question up behind you? Are you happy to? I'm quite happy to start yakking, Maddie. I've got um, an actual watch for an actual timer because I am notoriously bad at timekeeping. So I'm going to uh, set my reminder to uh, okay. to Jamie along. So okay. I think my question is, if the internet is such a scary place, should we really be helping folk go online at all? My background, I've been working in the sort of digital inequality space for a decade now, since um, before iPads were a thing, and um, looking to help people get online. And quite often what we hear um, in that context is, is the internet not actually increasing vulnerability for people? And when we're looking at a topic like misinformation, that kind of becomes really apparent. And in the current context, what we're seeing is all of a sudden working within digital inequality and looking at digital inclusion stuff, um, there's amazing stuff happening across the sector because when people are in the situation where they're in their own homes and we're in this lockdown situation, digital is an absolute lifeline. It's a lifeline to health information, to online shopping, to education, to all of these massive, massive benefits. And what the third sector has become extra, extra aware of is that people who are offline, who don't have digital skills and who don't have access to devices, those people are more vulnerable in the current situation. Uh, and that's impacting massively on how they're experiencing lockdown. So we're seeing totally just awe-inspiring stuff for somebody who's been doing this for ages to see the work that is happening across the third sector just now in terms of giving um, people access to devices when they need them um, or getting access to um, data. We know that data is a massive problem for people who are offline. So um, lots of organizations are looking to survive, uh, provide access to data and devices and also to skills. And everybody is looking at digital, um, digital inclusion work at the moment. Um, what we're also seeing is that um, the people that uh, need support the most around digital access are people who tend to be vulnerable already. So there's tons and tons of research around this, around the fact that digital inequality is totally linked to social inequality. So if you're struggling financial, you're less likely to have uh, digital skills. If um, you have a disability, you're less likely to have the digital skills that you need to get online. So all manners of groups that the third sector supports, those people are amongst people who are digitally excluded. And the reason um, I'm particularly interested in misinformation is um, we are also seeing that while we're giving people access to um, devices and connectivity and trying to support them with skills, we're seeing that social inequality playing out again. Um, so while there's all this amazing stuff going on by different organisations, we are seeing that misinformation, for instance, isn't really particularly impacting on those same groups of people. So Ofcom's done a, a power of great work in this, and um, I'll post the links um, in the chat pane in a wee minute for that. Um, but um, what Ofcom's shown is that uh, people from lower socioeconomic groups are more likely to be affected by misinformation related to COVID-19. What happened at the start was all of us were in a big massive quiz in terms of coronavirus. Everybody was kind of reading conspiracy theories and freaking out and everybody was seeing and quite commonly sharing misinformation um, at the start and then that's petered off actually over the, the last eight weeks. So Ofcom are kind of doing regular updates on this kind of uh, media literacy. And um, what, what it's showing is that people in uh, more sort of comfortable situations, they are tending to share that misinformation less and be taken in by it less. Kids from comfortable middle-class families are relying on parental models of support and the BBC. That's also data interesting. They're moving away from social media as a source of primary information and actually they're getting that more from parent carers and uh, the BBC, so traditional uh, media. And um, so misinformation um, is now a, a, an issue for those in more vulnerable and precarious situations. So older people who are living alone in particular, um, people who have intellectual disabilities and don't necessarily have a full network of support around them, 
Um, so there's all this kind of happening still. So even though we're doing all this fantastic work, um, inequality is carrying on there. So folk that struggle are continuing to struggle. So I suppose it's, what do we do about that in the situation that we're in? And what we kind of do is the same as the third sector always does. We become those trusted sources of information. So one of the most positive things that we can do is be that trusted intermediary. So when we're working in digital champion stuff, we know that folk are more likely to develop digital skills alongside somebody they're working with, anybody who's given them a whole package of support. In terms of misinformation, they're also more likely to trust that person. So if you think about it in children and families, what Ofcom are showing is that if that person has a parental person there, a parental uh, model there, they're more likely to go to them for support. If we look at the wider context, um, somebody who is experiencing homelessness, for instance, is more likely to trust a member of Simon community staff to help provide information and digital literacy. So being a strong model of kind of, of, of sort of digital knowledge in as much as you can, and being that trusted intermediary, I think really um, can help. And um, if you think about uh, it, it, towards the start of the outbreak, um, there, there were particular groups of people that were affected and all of them are being supported by the third sector there. But one of the challenges that we're hearing from, while everybody's crashing into this amazing work, one of the things we're hearing from digital champions that are working in that space is their own anxiety around, but I don't think I'm good enough to do this though. I don't think I have the confidence to be able to provide support. Um, I don't have the digital skills. I'm doing it and I'm doing my best, but I don't think I have the knowledge and understanding. So that's what we're hearing from the amazing folks that are, are doing the work on the ground. And so it, it's about kind of developing our own knowledge um, in this area, not to make us an incredibly high level of digital expert, but really to start developing our own digital understanding wherever we can, because um, although we have quite high levels of digital confidence in Scotland, so there's a piece of research done by Carnegie that showed, oh, well, we talk a good game in terms of privacy and security and, knowing what fake news is you know all the time you'll hear people say oh i can absolutely identify fake news but it's actually as jess pointed out incredibly complex so the more that we can do to actually develop our skills and then practically apply them the more confident we become in helping others and um, and there's some really fantastic resources out there i'm going to send post you guys to um three a uh, three online learning platforms who offer different courses. Um, so Future Learn is one of those. So Future Learn has a brilliant course on data literacy, which is really um, great. It has an introduction to cybersecurity, which is absolutely fantastic. And uh, the other one that I found today as well was an OU one. I'm just going to post all the links over in the chat pane. But if, if we start sort of walking the walk in terms of developing our digital understanding, we can become the credible messengers, we can become the people that are a trusted source of information, but also critically, I think, reflecting constantly, let's find out together and looking at that, we're all on this journey. It's not, it's not clear cut. There's, there's a, 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 it, the misinformation is so complex that we need to be constantly critically evaluating and supporting digital understanding amongst people that we see we're seeking to support not just saying if you're vulnerable we're better keeping you offline we absolutely need to support people in using the internet but in everything that we do support in their digital understanding as we are going through that so i'm just going to quickly post um those links up in the chat pane just now but that's essentially me am i on time yes i have i've managed to keep the time which is amazing so i'll just what i'll do is i'll post over the the first links that i'm posting over just now hopefully um, these are the ones that are related to kind of coronavirus in general and one of the ones I'd point out there, there's a wee quiz there um, which is part of a piece of research and it's trying to identify fake news around coronavirus with real news and it gives you a sort of overview of your own kind of digital understanding there and I think the majority of you will feel 
hopefully a wee bit stronger that actually I do I do have enough experience in this and um, I could help other people. The next wee list I'm going to put over is fact checking stuff and all of this is going to go in um, the amazing big uh, document that's happening anyway so I know that uh, Jane's probably just pasting all this over and if I'd been super organised clearly she would have had this in advance and that would all have been really nice but and then the very last bit, which is the most important thing uh, for me, is that's about you building up your own confidence so that, because tons of time when we're doing digital champion training, we spend ages saying to people, you do have the skills, you know? So most times people will say, we totally don't have the digital skills. So it's about boosting your own confidence in that. And these courses are a really brilliant starting point. So that's me over and out. Thank you very much, Irene. Well done on the timekeeping. That was pretty Thank impressive. <laughs> I, as, just to, to kind of round that up from a very personal point of view, I am, those people who know me, I am an incredibly gull gullible individual. I pretty much believe anything and everything that people tell me. <laughs> and the more kind of, the, the better I know that person and the more likely I am to believe them. And the more somebody says it with confidence, I'm like, oh, well, that must be true. And I was, when I was a frontline worker, I had to be really careful to not pass that information on to go, okay, okay, is this, are they just things to me? Is this actually the case? And to have to go and find it out. Even now within the team that we're in, I will take something on and have to go check it out. And I think what was really interesting at the start of the um, coronavirus, um, so, so at the start of the pandemic was, um, especially older adults who mm. have been trusted sources of, of information but whose own digital literacy isn't, doesn't tend to be great. That, that demographic, that's a sweeping generalisation, but if you're older, you're less likely to have um, digital skills. Mm. Um, depends on your social demographic, but also those folk were sharing um, misinformation believing it to come from a place of good going this is something because we were all freaking out like i said so that particular group and now actually what's happened over the eight weeks is that group um depending on your social class you're less likely to share so it's kind of changed as that's gone on but at the start um misinformation was really kind of all over the shop and coming from trusted sources so it's really important to kind of be that critical person all the time and everything you're sharing yeah. because it, it gets spread so rapidly. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Alison. Uh, Alison Stone now. I was checking, where are you? Oh, yes, there you are in New York. I'm here. Hello. In New York. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I, and if you, uh, Alison, do you want your question up behind you? Are you happy just to go ahead? Uh, remind me of my question. Remind everybody of my question. What was your question? <laughs> Ross put them right at the start. Where is the question? Uh, so, Alison, yours was if um, so. What a uh, what can you do to ensure you stay safe online? It's less technical than you think. So, your question was, what can you do to ensure you stay safe online? It's less technical than you think. Okay, okay, grand. Thank you. Um, I've got to say a big thank you to the people, Irene and Jess, who have come before me because they have really set the scene for everything that I'm, I'm going to say um, about misinformation. Irene's talked quite a lot about, about digital champions and people who are using their digital champion skills for good. I want to talk a little bit about cyber criminals who are using their digital champion skills not for good. Um, big thumbs down from Irene there. Um, since the start of, of the COVID outbreak, um, we have seen a massive, massive increase in COVID-related fraud, COVID-related scams, COVID-related cyber stuff. Um, there, at the start of the outbreak, there wasn't as such an increase in the amount of, of cyber activity um, that was being done fraudulently. There was a big shift in its focus though. Um, and since the start of the activity, the, 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 the pandemic, the focus has changed to near as damn it to COVID related stuff um, as a way of cyber criminals putting the fear of God in you and really monetizing your gullibility for want of another word. Um, I'm going to talk through a, a few of the scams that we've seen a lot more of um, and then I'm going to point you to some resources that will allow you to really just sense check what it is that, that you're seeing. Um, 
one thing that I will, I will say as a caveat, cyber, cyber crime these days and the quality of cyber scam information, phishing emails and that sort of thing that we see is very, very high. Uh, it is incredibly easy to be taken in by this stuff because the people that put these phishing emails together have done their research, they've done the social engineering that says, okay, for example, one that I get near as damn it every Friday afternoon is from Anna Fowley, the chief exec at um, SCBO, asking me to go out and buy Amazon vouchers. Now, the people that have, have crafted that phishing email have done their research. They know that Anna is the chief exec at SCBO. They know that I'm an employee of. Um, plausibly, they, they've put together quite a well-crafted piece of, of information that people could quite legitimately fall for. Um, and one of the, the real message that we try and, and, and when we do cyber education and talk to people about is, is to reassure people that, you know, you're not daft, you're not silly if you, if you fall for this, because these guys are really, really good. Um, they are working in an industry that is designed to take our money off of us and to abuse our trust. And that's, that's really how they make, they make their dosh at the end of the day. So the underlying message here is, is misinformation is out there. Cyber criminals use it against us. Um, and we should really never feel ashamed for falling for it um, because they are very, very good. Um, as I say, the increase since the start of the pandemic has really shifted towards a lot of COVID, corona related fraud, scams, schemes, that sort of thing. Um, I imagine everybody has seen the texts that have been sent. Well, we got the original text out from the government saying blah, 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 blah. On the back of that, there has been a number of texts that people have experienced that have said, you've been caught going outside the door for more than what your one daily work. You've got to click on this link and pay this fine. Um, that was a biggie. The one that we had last week was um, on the back of the, the COVID tracing apps in the Isle of Wight. Um, you have been close to somebody who has been impacted by COVID. We want you to trace this, click on this link. The, these links take you to either to download malware onto your system or they may take you to a, a site where they're collecting money from you for one, some reason or another. Um, but it's just to be aware that these things are out there and they are trying to manipulate the information that, that, that we are seeing and we are reacting to. Um, tax tech scams have been a biggie. Um, another thing that we've seen a lot of is PPE um, scams. If you go on and do a Google search, um, as my 80 year old next door neighbor did, looking for face masks, because she wanted to go to Sainsbury's. Um, she went online and she put in face masks, PPE, something like that. And she was presented with a load of what can only be fake websites that will sell her this, these products. Now, they, what, what they want you to do is to go online. They want to take you, you want you to create an account um, where they can harvest your credentials. Uh, one of the reasons for harvesting credentials is that most of us, if we're in any way human, probably use the same username and password on multiple websites. So when they have that once, there's every possibility that they can go and use the same two credentials, username and passwords to try and get into other potentially more monetized websites like your banking, for example. Um, but yeah, Rona was, was there looking at the, these various different sites selling PPE and wanting to buy some of this stuff. Um, you've got to you've got to sense check these things and think okay we're hearing on a daily basis at five o'clock that the government cannot source ppe why should this website actually have that stuff available you've got to think about you know is this real apply the common sense jess said if it's too good to be true it possibly is um and that's a, a, a thing that you've really got to when you you're looking at anything sort of cyber related take that time to think you know is that is that actually correct? Can I get that from that person? The other thing that we're seeing a lot of is testing kits. Um, you can't buy testing kits online, or you can. It's it's through I think Amazon and not very much. They're not available from the whole world, and it's auntie. Um, there is a limited supply of this stuff. So if you're out there looking for it, most of the stuff that you're seeing again is a scam just to take your money. Um, fake websites. I and it's full confession time here. I, on Saturday night, watched the live streaming of Let's Rock, the 80s festival. Um, it was brilliant. It was absolutely fantastic. Uh, they were raising funds for the Child Bereavement Trust. 
it was free to view the, the, the program itself, 80s bands, nothing not to like, um, but you didn't have to pay a fee, but you were, they were asking you to give a donation. Um, I went onto their Facebook page where it was linked from and how it was promoted. Um, and the cyber criminals had managed to break the links on the donation websites on that page. So they were diverting funds away from the, the beneficiaries of the Child Bereavement Trust to another source. We've seen a lot of fake websites that come up. Um, and this happens every time that you get some sort of natural disaster. People want to be generous with their money there, and, and cyber criminals are generally one step ahead at, at making sure they get something up that you're not putting your donation into the right coffers, it's going somewhere else. So um, the next one that everybody needs to be aware of, and there will be a big kickoff around this when it gets rolled out, is the COVID testing app. Um, there's potentially a lot of, of criminal activity that will be associated with that. So these are things that are happening um, and these, these bad guys are really just trying to take advantage of, of what our fears are, our concerns are and all that sort of thing. We've also seen a huge increase in phishing um, and a huge increase in mandate fraud. This is because we're now all working in, in the remote environments that we're in and some of the processes that we have, would have had in the office are different or slightly broken um, and certainly initially when you know we, we if we're in the office and we want a bill to be paid we have to get it authorized by such and such by such and such by such and such um, that process is, is very defined when we moved into this new way of working cyber criminals quite quickly tried to take advantage of of us maybe not having the the new protocols and new processes in place um, to try and make things happen in a slightly different way so I, I guess I'm, what I'm trying to say is, is really just think very carefully about anything that appears slightly out of the ordinary. Um, phishing, as I say, is a, is a biggie. Um, what you tend to see with a phishing email um, and ways you can protect yourself is, is look at the grammar, look at if there's a sense of urgency, you know, you need to act on this now. Um, something that is, is quite an extraordinary activity like the CEO asking me to go and buy Amazon vouchers that's never going to happen just question 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 this sort of thing um, the there are resources that are available um, the trading standards produce on a weekly basis a really really good newsletter um, which has a lot of links to all of the very topical scams because we, we've seen over the last eight weeks things have have moved through different phases and, uh, and, and different scams have have reared their ugly heads um, so i would encourage everybody to sign up to the trading standards scam newsletter uh, the cyber resilience unit at scottish government um, produce a bulletin on a weekly basis which i'm involved in the the curation of the information for that and the the, the content that again is is really really good at signposting you to trusted sources giving you a very topical idea of what's going on at the moment. Um, and the main one that we refer everybody to for, because they're the Oracle in cyber in the UK, it's the National Cyber Security Centre. Um, they've got some really, really good stuff, really topical stuff on video conferencing. Whoops, there's my timer. Um, video conferencing, because everybody's been very concerned about Zoom and all the rest. Um, and some really good resources there for, for you to avail yourself of. Um, that clearly is my 10 minutes up. Um, I think, um, Maddie, you've got the, the resource links that I'm sharing. Um, happy to ask any, answer any questions. Sorry, I, can't, I clearly can't do two things at once today, Alison. Thank you very much, Alison. I've just put those um, links that Alison mentioned. So they're in chat. I think Siobhan's been having major technical issues today. So it's just, whatever week lockdown day it is uh, so oh you're back hello you're there sorry <laughs> so I, I've put those links in but again um, Jen will put them into the doc so you'll have them as well um, at the end of it thank you very much Alison do you want to take questions has anybody got any thoughts anything you'd like to say um, have we put the fear of God in everybody I know <laughs> <laughs> any comments Siobhan's got a question. Mine was just a comment, so it's something that saved me from falling into a lot of scams, which is just to always check the email address that something's come from. So the first kind of thing that I do if I've got an email that's unexpected is always check what that address is. Uh, so 
it can sometimes look so the one that Alison talked about from our chief exec it actually had her name there but as soon as I clicked on the from email it was obvious it wasn't from her account and I've had quite a few into my personal email that have had similar issues recently as well um, and one looked everything in the email was correct the English was correct everything looked sensible it was from Sainsbury's Bank and then when I clicked on it it was an Australian email address so that was obviously a scam so that was my kind of thing that saved me quite often mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as I said, these things do look really, really plausible. Um, it, you're, you're, no, you're not daft if you fall for them because they are very well crafted. They're, they're designed to do a job. And I think what you said there as well, Siobhan, it ties into something that Jess had kind of said in terms of that empathetic thing. So if you're working with somebody who has poor digital skills or who's quite new to the internet, that kind of has happened to me and this is what I did, or here's a wee bit of learning, or here, because because folk, so we've signposted really high level resources, but people that are new to the internet need exactly what you're saying, Siobhan. They need the tiny wee bit of digital understanding that you're given. And you, I'd like, we as frontline workers need to go, that's enough though. Like I'm doing, I, I, I do have some skills that I can share without having to go into these sort of really complex um, resources. It's also about helping people feel confident because that also ties into the fact that they'll tell you when something's got a wee bit more serious, you know, if something's happened. So the more that we can share our own experiences and how we manage risk every day and using the internet because folk that are offline think we're all flipping geniuses and I spent 10 years going I, I don't actually know that much about digital I just get quite excited about it um, so people who are offline think we're all geniuses when actually most of us are just muddling through so the more we can sort of um, share our kind of weird risk management strategies that we have and going oh yeah this is what I do and and saying it like a normal person would say it rather than an IT specialist, the more we're going to help people that are vulnerable develop those skills. I think that's something I would back up if I just again own personal experience with my with my, my old mum at the grand old age of 76. She the my mum's particularly digitally savvy. She does, she's got two iPads and an iPhone. She knows what she's doing. She's got a laptop, she kind of gets on there. But when she gets somebody who will phone her up to say, if you don't give me so much money, I'm going to make sure your printer and your laptop never work again. It's that fear factor and it's a lack of confidence and that she will immediately default back to oh, this. I don't know. I don't know about this. I'm not the expert. What will I do? So it is very much that confidence, as you're saying. And I think that's something that we found at STVO through so a lot of the training that we've done and the, the work that Ross does through the Senior Leader Programme is that even as chief execs, if there is a... a a lack of confidence there in any amount, then that's where the scammers get us, if you like, for want of a better phrase, is being able to actually to, to kind of use that against us to go, ah, you don't know if this is true or not, so I'm just going to keep bombarding you. And that can be the thing that freaks people out. And once you've, you've had that experience, it's like if we were all, you know, we have a bad experience at school, that then goes into our next experience of learning. And that's the same with a lot of these online scams and certainly with working in that environment as well. It just makes a difference to actually, well, what happened to me is it doesn't make you stupid. It doesn't make you an idiot. It's happening to all of us. So let's bear that in mind. And certainly within a, a work context of that level of misinformation, if, I, if I'm in the digital team and I pass on misinformation to somebody who's not in the digital team they'll think that I'm the expert because I'm in the digital team and then I you know that kind of cascading effect oh but Maddie said so it must be true she's in the digital team and I have to go no 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 and that's no I didn't so it's that kind of being aware of how other people perceive us I, I know that does happen certainly within the work that we do is that people do perceive us as the digital experts so we do have to do our best to say no uh, it is, I know a bit more about this than you do because this is my job. That's the, that's the way that it works. So it's, it's quite a, a kind of a key thing. Anybody else got any questions? Irene said, if you it, just unmute yourself, please do. There's, a, there's a, a group of us enough to be able to do that. Any other thoughts, comments, insights? I've got, I've got a really quick 
thing I think just that you've prompted me to think of, which is just that going forward, I expect that we will see a lot more conspiracy theory type issues, uh, coronavirus related. So, uh, you know, if there's a vaccine, <laughs> you know, half the population is going to think that it's not really a vaccine and blah, blah, blah. Um, also, I am finding as I'm doing stuff at the moment in a way that I never used to, I am getting people suggesting stuff to me so asking me for example about what is the issue uh, you know is there any issue with radiation from devices yeah so you it's it's just it's becoming more of a thing that people are getting drawn into some of this stuff so so be prepared you know you might well uh, get an unexpected question or comment and it's it is about your kind of response to that that isn't just like oh my god where are you coming from but let's just you know uh, do the empathy maps ask some questions how can we look at this together that kind of stuff can I just ask a quick question, I guess, for the people in the room? Are you finding that you're getting pressure from either people in your organisation or externally around security for specific platforms you're using and there being, I guess, misinformation around that as well? Because I'm just kind of building on that Alison wrote a really good blog post about Zoom and some kind of security concerns and addressing some of those. And there's been a lot of misinformation around about Zoom. And I'm definitely not saying it's the most secure platform because it's not but actually a lot of the stuff that went wrong in terms of things like Zoom bombing, and, and we've been <laughs> we've been affected by it in these calls as well, is, is often down to human error. And I'd be interested to know just kind of how that's that's come up. Because we're hearing anecdotally a lot of charities who can't, for example, use Zoom because they're funded by a local authority and someone in a local authority, often with no authority, has just said, you're not allowed to use Zoom, it's part of your yes. agreement. So it'd be interesting I've got a dash to know. to another call, but um, just like just on that, I'm from England, so obviously slightly different. Yep. Um, we're flagging it up massively at the Manchester level because we've got a number of public sector partners, not just local authorities, but also health and also um, justice, so probation services, who are trying to dictate what platforms VCSE organisations can use. It does usually come Teams versus Zoom, but we've also had um, commissioners asking blue jeans to be downloaded, which when we looked at it was horrific. Um, WebEx obviously pops up again. Um, and it, it would wear flagging up through the commissioning route and through other routes because we're trying to flag that this isn't actually a cyber issue. Most of it is actually, and it's not data protection, which is also ruled as the, the other reason. It's actually having impacts on service users because some service users don't actually like Teams because they can't see everybody and it freaks their heads out. Um, and also cost implications and commission implications. So we are feeling that up and I've heard but I haven't got um, evidence on this but some of the national charities like Anxiety UK and a couple of others have taken it up their UK branches because it's not just happening in Greater Manchester obviously you guys mentioned it in Scotland um, we're not making massive progress on it but some people are really considerate and I know Nesta's picked up on it as well as part of their think tank work and how it's actually impacting on inequalities mm -hmm. yeah 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 I don't know uh, Jennifer you want to so come yeah I'm sorry it was just to say we're, we're finding that in, in our charity that we've kind of delayed transforming some of our services online I think because we're just so worried that we hear all the the horror stories and um, and um, we the charity we work for used as a mental health drop-in hub so we used to meet face to face and we're trying to think well, how do we still do that in an online environment and I found the some of the background reading that you'd sent prior to this quite interesting it I put my mind a wee bit just about saying how we can't control everything but we can mitigate the risks so I was thinking, well, when we're in a room on a normal night at our hub, what's to say that, now I'm not, this, I would hope this wouldn't happen, but what's to say one of our volunteers or one of our trusted people doesn't go off down the pub and chat about what has been discussed in confidence? So I guess it's the same that you have that risk assessment about what we speak about online. And um, some of our volunteers work for the NHS and they've been told that they can't use Zoom at all, but we were thinking about making it accessible to our service users and we think well most of them won't have teams or the microsoft packages so i guess it's just it's yeah, getting right. so so one of the pieces of work i've done just in the last wee while is with neighborhood networks and they've got a lot of folk with intellectual disabilities and one of the things we did was just a bit with parent carers around um, just discussion of that risk as well and that kind of applies whether you're working with the individual or um, parent carers or whoever, but it's that discussion of, you know what, we you trust us normally to support those people in that social context. Yeah. 
So here's what we're going to do just now. Here's how we're going to try our best. We can get rid of risk. But what we know is that those people are really struggling without the service that mm -hmm. we normally provide, yep. that things are getting worse for them if we're not there as that trusted person they see every week. So we want to continue to be a trusted person in a new environment where we're learning together. We're going to do everything we can, but we can't get rid of this. But all we can do is constantly be looking at that. That's not to say that the systems aren't important. So it is important to be yeah. reflective of the systems we are trying to use and to, to look around for best practice and everything else. But you know what you're saying about the Teams versus Zoom versus whatever, if you're trying to create um, an accessible opportunity for people, you do need to look where the bodies are. There's been mm -hmm. um, a massive use of WhatsApp, for instance, because that's the most commonly used platform. So lots of organisations are going to that. But I think it's about risk, it, talking about risk and trying to support everybody around that discussion. Mm -hmm. So pulling other people into it as well to say, look, there is a risk, but there's a risk walking down the road. Yeah. And how, how can we manage it and how can we use, how can we help others in managing that risk as well? So I think that's a really valuable point you're making, Jennifer. No, great. And, that, and all these resources are fab. And I'll be here, pass them all on to our um, board members and volunteers. So it's really useful. Thanks. Got a whole minute left. Anybody else? Any final thoughts? Um, I have a slightly unrelated question. Jess, what were you using to present? <laughs> We've all asked that question, <laughs> Jess. So I use Prezi, and I just really like Prezi, but it's very resource intensive in terms of your time um, to, to learn how to use it. That What I was using just then was called Prezi Video, and I just it's a fairly relatively new product, but I just quite like it because it can bring stuff up on screen at the same time. Uh, as you present so it's prezi there is a cost but it's cheaper for educators it might be a charity version as well um, and as i say it, it takes a bit of work more than happy to have a chat with anybody about it if you want to talk to me offline my god i've spent hours and hours trying to work out to get prezi to work <laughs> i like prezi too it's it's it takes over for the death from powerpoint uh, yeah it actually keeps people awake i think i both ross and i were messing each other what's jess using what's jess using <laughs> get on that buckle i find out get yeah, ross message me as well <laughs> what is that <laughs> the fact we can see you and see the sides of the background so a kind of a final question for us um here is what topics would you like to see us doing things so what are what are the other topics that you would be interested in hearing from us from yourselves what would you like us to do if you stick those in the chat that would be great or you can shout them out as well please do and then that can help us. We're, we're, we're doing our best to respond to the things that we're hearing, uh, to what the queries are coming in, and to things that our people are saying. So if you, the more you let us know, then the better we can get it, helpfully, hopefully getting the right information out there to you. So anything you've got, please stick it in the chat box. That would be super. Any final thoughts from you, Ross? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think, uh, I know the Zoom one's like boring and it comes up over and over and over and it feels like we answer it over and over and over. But I do think like Alison's blog, which we can put a link to, but if you just Google Alison Stone SCDO blog, Zoom, <laughs> you can tell I'm really good at Google and stuff here. Um, <laughs> you'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll find a link there. But I've, I've sent it on to loads of organisations because it's literally like, it's probably the biggest platform specific yep. question that keeps coming up is can we use them or can we not use them so yeah go and, and the other thing i would say is like go away and test out alternatives and your teams do it in a safe closed space mm -hmm. and figure out what's going to work for you and um, but i do think like i mean jennifer mentioned that and the person who left mentioned it um, and irene mentioned it is if your users are comfortable with a certain platform and you try and shoot on them and i think she mentioned blue jeans that's a 90s perfume is it not anyway, <laughs> right? so she mentioned blue jeans never heard of it but if you're trying to shoehorn them in a platform they've never heard of before and they've got to now download something to make it even work, I mean, that's a lot of steps and a lot of asks for someone. So I just think that's, that's worth keeping in mind. The final thing for me was my survey gizmo. I was going to ask, I was going to test asking you all to complete a quick survey gizmo from, from this one, but I can't find the link to it. <laughs> so I'm really sorry. <laughs> My, it's my this is like my worst lockdown day ever so i do apologize to everybody I've not going to go. oh she was it thank you Ooh. so much you this is where we have so many people to help us do these things 
if you could fill that out, it's very, it's, as Siobhan says, it's literally four questions. Um, please do complete it. And it helps us just to gather a bit more information because we are doing these calls where at the moment we're kind of trying different ways of working, different formats. So the more information you give us, the better. And hopefully we can try and get these to meet your needs as much as possible. I'll, think, I'll round it up there. Thank you very much. I was, going to say, I was going to shamelessly plug the upcoming calls that we've got because mm -hmm. we've got the cybersecurity one tomorrow with Derek Gordon from PwC and we've also got one on service design next week so if you uh, go to the SCVO events page you'll, you'll find those. Thank you. I think Jen's put them up in the links and. there. Thank you all very much. Thank you for your patience. I uh, hope you got something out of today and great to speak to you all and we'll see you at other things. Thank you very much. Thanks, Irene, Jess, and Alison. That was great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was really good. Thank you.